The forest was black and silent. A little way into it, they reached a fork in the earth path, and Harry, Hermione and Hagrid took the left path, while Malfoy, Neville and Fang took the right. They walked in silence, their eyes on the ground. Every now and then, a ray of moonlight through the branches above lit a spot of silver-blue blood on the fallen leaves. Harry saw that Hagrid looked very worried. Could a werewolf be killing the unicorns? Harry asked. Not fast enough, said Hagrid. It's not easy to catch a unicorn. They're powerful magic creatures. I never knew one to be hurt before. They walked past a mossy tree stump. Harry could hear running water. There must be a stream somewhere close by. There were still spots of unicorn blood here and there along the winding path. You're right, Hermione, Hagrid whispered. Don't worry, it can't have gone far if it's this badly hurt, and then we'll be able to get behind that tree. Hagrid seized Harry and Hermione and hoisted them off the path behind a towering oak. He pulled out an arrow and fitted it into his crossbow, raising it ready to fire. The three of them listened. Something was slithering over dead leaves nearby. It sounded like a cloak trailing along the ground. Hagrid was squinting at the dark path, but after a few seconds, the sound faded away. I knew it, he murmured. There's something in here that shouldn't be. A werewolf, Harry suggested. That wasn't no werewolf, and if it, w it wasn't no unicorn neither, said Hagrid grimly. Right, follow me, but be careful now. They walked more slowly, ears straining for the faintest sound. Suddenly, in a clearing ahead, something definitely moved. Who's there? Hagrid called. Show yourself. I'm armed. And into the clearing came, is it a man or a horse? To the waist, a man with red hair and beard, but below that was a horse's gleaming chestnut body with a long reddish tail. Harry and Hermione's jaws dropped. Oh, it's you, Ronan, said Hagrid in relief. How are you? He walked forward and shook the centaur's hand. Good evening to you, Hagrid, said Ronan. He had a deep, sorrowful voice. Are you going to shoot me? Can't be too careful, Ronan, said Hagrid, patting his crossbow. There's something bad loose in this forest. This is Harry Potter and Hermione Granger, by the way. Students up at the school. And this is Ronan, you two. He's a centaur. We'd noticed, said Hermione faintly. Good evening, said Ronan. Students, are you? And do you learn much up at that school? Um, a bit, said Hermione timidly. A bit. Well, that's something, Ronan signed. Sighed. He flung back his head and stared at the sky. Mars is bright tonight. Yeah, said Hagrid, glancing up too. Listen, I'm glad we've run into you, Ronan, because there's a unicorn been hurt. Have you seen anything? Ronan didn't answer immediately. He stared unblinkingly upwards and then sighed again. Always the innocent are the first victims, he said. So it has been for ages past, so it is now. Yeah, said Hagrid, but have you seen anything, Ronan? Anything unusual? Mars is bright tonight, Ronan repeated, while Hagrid watched him impatiently. Unusually bright. Yeah, but I was meaning anything unusual a bit nearer home, said Hagrid. So you haven't noticed anything strange? Yet again, Ronan took a while to answer. At last, he said, the forest hides many secrets. The movement in the trees behind Ronan made Hagrid raise his bow again, but it was only a second centaur, black-haired, embodied, and wilder looking than Ronan. Hello, Bane, said Hagrid. All right. Good evening, Hagrid. I hope you're well. Well enough. Look, I've just been asking Ronan. You seen anything odd in here lately? Only there's a unicorn been injured. Would you know anything about it? Bane walked over to stand next to Ronan. He looked skywards. Mars is bright tonight, he said simply. We've heard, said Hagrid grumpily. Well, if either of you do see anything, let me know, won't you? We'll be off then. Harry and Hermione followed him out of the clearing, staring over their shoulders at Ronan and Bane until the trees blocked their view. Never, said Hagrid irritably, try and get a straight answer out of a centaur. Bloody stargazers. Not interested in anything closer than the moon. Are there many of them in here? asked Hermione. Oh, a fair few. Keep themselves to themselves mostly, but they're good enough about turning up if I ever want a word. They're deep minds, centaurs. They know things. Just don't let on much. Do you think that was a centaur we heard earlier? said Harry. Did that sound like hooves to you? Nah, if you ask me, that was what's been killing the unicorn. Never heard anything like it before. They walked on through the dense, dark trees. Harry kept looking nervously over his shoulder. He had the nasty feeling they were being watched. He was very glad they had Hagrid and his crossbow with them. They had just passed a bend in the path when Hermione grabbed Hagrid's arm. Hagrid, look, red sparks. The others are in trouble. You two wait here, Hagrid shouted. Stay on the path. I'll come back for you. They heard him crashing away through the undergrowth and stood looking at each other, very scared, until they couldn't hear anything but the rustling leaves around them. You don't think they've been hurt, do you? whispered Hermione. I don't care if Malfoy has, but if something's got Neville, it's our fault he's here in the first place. The minutes dragged by. Their ears seemed sharper than usual. 
Harry seemed to be picking up every sigh of the wind, every cracking twig. What was going on? Where were the others? At last, a great crunching noise announced Hagrid's return. Malfoy, Neville and Fang were with him. Hagrid was fuming. Malfoy, it seemed, had sneaked up behind Neville and grabbed him for a joke. Neville had panicked and sent up the sparks. We'll be lucky to catch anything now with the racket you two are making. Right, we're changing groups. Neville, you stay with me and Hermione. Harry, you go with Fang and this idiot. I'm sorry, Hagrid added to him in a whisper, but he'll have a harder time frightening you, and we've got to get this done. So Harry set off into the heart of the forest with Malfoy and Fang. They walked for nearly half an hour, deeper and deeper into the forest until the path became almost impossible to follow because the trees were so thick. Harry thought the blood seemed to be getting thicker. There were splashes on the roots of a tree, as though the poor creature had been thrashing around in pain close by. Harry could see a clearing ahead through the tangled branches of an ancient oak. Look, he murdered, holding out his arm to stop Malfoy. Something bright white was gleaming on the ground. They inched closer. It was the unicorn, all right, and it was dead. Harry had never seen anything so beautiful and sad. Its long, slender legs were stuck out at odd angles where it had fallen, and its mane and its mane was spread pearly white on the dark leaves. Harry had taken one step towards it when a slithering sound made him freeze where he stood. A bush on the edge of the clearing quivered. Then, out of the shadows, a hooded figure came crawling across the ground like some stalking beast. Harry, Malfoy and Fang stood transfixed. The cloaked figure reached the unicorn. It lowered its head over the wounds on the animal's side and began to drink its blood. No! Nah! Malfoy let out a terrible scream and bolted. So did Fang. The hooded figure raised its head and looked right at Harry. Unicorn blood was dribbling down its front. It got to its feet and came swiftly towards him. He couldn't move for fear. Then a pain pierced his head like he'd never felt before. It was as though his scar was on fire. Half blinded, he staggered backwards. He heard hooves behind him, galloping, and something jumped clean over him, charging at the figure. The pain in Harry's head was so bad he fell to his knees. It took a minute or two to pass. When he looked up, the figure had gone. A centaur was standing over him. Not Ronan or Bane, this one looked younger. He had white blonde hair and a palomino body. Are you all right? said the centaur, pulling Harry to his feet. Yes, thank you. What was that? The centaur didn't answer. He had astonishingly blue eyes, like pale sapphires. He looked carefully at Harry, his eyes lingering on the scar which stood out, livid, on Harry's forehead. You are the potter boy, he said. You had better get back to Hagrid. The forest is not safe at this time, especially for you. Can you ride? It'll be quicker this way. My name's Friends, he added, as he lowered himself onto his front legs so that Harry could clamber onto his back. There was suddenly a sound of more galloping from the other side of the clearing. Ronan and Bane came bursting through the trees, their flanks he heaving and sweaty. Friends, Bane thundered. What are you doing? You have a human on your back. Have you no shame? Are you a common mule? Do you realise who this is? said Friends. This is the Potter boy. The quicker he leaves the forest, the better. What have you been telling him? growled Bane. Remember... Friends, we are sworn not to set ourselves against the heavens. Have we not read what it is come? Have we not read what is to come in the movement of the planets? Ronan pawed the ground nervously. I'm sure Friends thought he was acting for the best. He said in his gloomy voice. Bane kicked his back legs in anger. For the best. What is that to do with us? Centaurs are concerned with what has been foretold. It's not our business to run around like donkeys after stray humans in our forest. Friends suddenly reared onto his hind legs in anger, so that Harry had to grab his shoulders to stay on. Do you not see that unicorn? Friends bellowed at Bane. Do you not understand why it was killed? Why have the planets not let you in on that secret? I set myself against what is lurking in this forest, Bane. Yes, with humans alongside me if I must. And Ferenz whisked around, with Harry clutching on as best he could. They plunged off into the trees, leaving Ronan and Bane behind them. Harry didn't have a clue what was going on. Why is Bane so angry? He asked. What was that thing you saved me from, anyway? Ferenz slowed to a walk, warned Harry to keep his head bowed in case of low-hanging branches, but did not answer Harry's question. They made their way through the trees in silence, so long that Harry thought Ferenz didn't want to talk to him anymore. They were passing through a particularly dense patch of trees, however, when Ferenz suddenly stopped. Harry Potter, do you know what unicorn blood is used for? No, said Harry, startled by the old question. You've only used the horn and tail hair in potions. That is because it is a monstrous thing to slay a unicorn, said Ferenz. Only one who has nothing to lose and everything to gain will commit such a crime. The blood of a unicorn will keep you alive, even if you are an inch from death, but at a terrible price. You have slain something pure and defenceless to save yourself, and you will have put and you will have but half life, a cursed life, from the moment the blood touches your lips. Harry stared at the back of Ferenzi's head, which was dappled silver in the moonlight. 
But who'd be that desperate, he wondered aloud. If you're going to be cursed forever, death's better, isn't it? It is, Ferenz agreed, unless all you need is to stay alive long enough to drink something else, something that will bring you back to full strength and power, something that will mean you can never die. Mr Potter, do you know what is hidden in the school at this very moment? The Philosopher's Stone, of course, the elixir of life, but I don't understand who... Can you think of any? Can you think of nobody who has waited many years to return to power, who has clung to life, awaiting their chance? It was as though an iron fist had clenched suddenly around Harry's heart. Over the rustling of the trees, he seemed to hear once more what Hagrid had told him on the night they had met. Some say he died. Codswallop, in my opinion. Don't, it, don't know if he had enough human left in him to die. Do you mean, Harry croaked, that was Vol... Harry, Harry, are you all right? Hermione was running towards them down the path, Hagrid puffing along behind her. I'm fine, said Harry, hardly knowing what he was saying. The unicorn stared Hagrid. It's in that clearing back there. This is where I leave you, Ferenz murmured as Hagrid hurried off to examine the unicorn. You are safe now. Harry slid off his back. Good luck, Harry Potter, said Ferenz. The planets have been read wrongly before now, even by centaurs. I hope this is one of those times. He turned and cantered back into the depths of the forest, leaving Harry shivering behind him. Ron had fallen asleep in the dark common room, waiting for them to return. He shouted something about Quidditch fouls when Harry roughly shook him awake. In a matter of seconds, though, he was wide-eyed as Harry began to tell him and Hermione what had happened in the forest. Harry couldn't sit down. He paced up and down in front of the fire. He was still shaking. Snape wants a stone for Voldemort, and Voldemort's waiting in the forest. And all this time, we thought Snape just wanted to get rich. Stop saying the name, said Ron in a terrified whisper, as he thought Voldemort could hear them. Harry wasn't listening. Friends saved me, but he shouldn't have done. Bane was furious. He was talking about interfering with what the planets say is going to happen. They must show that Voldemort's coming back. Bane thinks Friends should have let Voldemort kill me. I suppose what's written in the stars. I suppose that's written in the stars as well. Then stop saying the name, Ron hissed. So all I've got to wait for now is Snape to steal the stone. Harry went on feverishly. Then Voldemort will be able to come and finish me off. Well, I suppose Bane will be happy. Hermione looked very frightened, but she had a word of comfort. Harry, everyone says Dumbledore's the only one you know who was ever afraid of. With Dumbledore around, you know who won't touch you. Anyway, who says the centaurs are right? It sounds like fortune telling to me, and Professor McGonagall says that's a very imprecise branch of magic. The sky had turned light before they stopped talking. They went to bed exhausted, their throats sore, but the night's surprises weren't over. When Harry pulled back his sheets, he found his invisibility cloak folded neatly underneath him. There was a note pinned to it, just in 